Chris Proctor, most of you heard him yesterday. The handiest way for me, I think, to summarize him is he's a very confused young fella. <laughs> There's something about he started in New Zealand, but I wouldn't think he's a proper New Zealander if he moved lock, stock and barrel over to Australia. There's another bit of confusion about 11 hours a cow. That's to run them for the year. I presume they haven't been milked at that. <laughs> Chris, it's not a great introduction, but thank you very much. Well, oh, thanks for that uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pretty hard act to follow. I'm feeling a lot better today. Yesterday, when I, the first presentation, it was uh, equivalent to six o'clock in the morning back in Melbourne. Today, it's about quarter past eight in the evening, so feeling uh, a lot more fresher. And I stayed off the whiskey, unlike some, Mike, who got to bed at four o'clock this morning. So we're talking about, um, I suppose, staffing, um, farm systems, and it's something that, you know, Dairy farming has not got its, uh, is on its own in terms of struggling to find staff. I was in Mel one of the things with living in Melbourne is that I have, you know, have quite a bit of access to the, I suppose, the corporate side of um, uh, the world. And um, I was talking to one of the largest travel agents in, uh, in, in the world, and they, ha they are talking about exactly the same thing about attracting staff, retaining staff, and the costs of not having the right staff and staffing systems you know, within their office. So we, we're not on our own. So at every conference so, um, that I attend, I hear you know, people presenting on staffing, uh, presenting papers. Um, in 2000, I think it was at the Irish Grasslands Association conference. Again, there was a, a paper on staffing there because I presented it. I'll be telling you about my experiences, and I definitely have not got it right every time. So, 35 years I've been employing people on the, um, on the farm. Generally, my number one role has been to employ people that I can have a beer with at the end of the day. I'm not an alcoholic, but I enjoy a beer, and I like a discussion around anything other than farming as well. So, I think that person, you know, that um, being able to sit down and understand where people are uh, in their lives, what issues they've got, um, getting to you know, see how they tick, it's really important. Geez, that's loud, isn't it? So my management over time has, uh, has certainly evolved. Um, with the scale of the farms, I'm, I'm now, and not living on the farms, uh, my responsibility is more around making sure I've got the right manager on the farm who has then got the right skills in terms of employing staff and, um, and, and, and sort of giving him guidance and, and advice um, on that. So we're going to talk about the Lesper Park farm. This is the farm that uh, I talked about yesterday. Um, it was a, a, a farm that I purchased um, and took over in December 2014, an exist, existing dairy farm. Um, uh, so I shut down the farm. Uh, re reconverted it, um, and I'll be putting up some um, farm slides a little bit later on about it, um, and, and rejig lane laneways, raceways, tracks, whatever you call it over here. So in terms of cow flow, um, try to make it an easy setup operation. So the farm is less than yeah, 244 hectares, 604 acres. Within that, there's 146 hectares of uh, centre pivot irrigation. That's really the milking platform. So the rest of the land is dry land. The um, given understanding on grass growth, yeah, we're growing 20, 22 tonne of dry matter under the pivots. With, of course, the advantage of being the, the winter where we're growing sort of 35 kilos a hectare um, uh, a day. And whereas compared with the dry land, that is around on the support land, it grows about nine tonne, eight to nine tonne a year. And at the moment, it's as brown as this lectern here. So we're peak milking 620 cows. Uh, with production of, you know, the 560 kilos a cow. Uh, I, I, you would say the farm is overstocked, but I've always been in the philosophy it's easier to manage a deficit than it is a surplus. So we're around 2,300 kilos of live weight per hectare under, under the pivots. One calving a year, 
starting on the 8th of August. Um, two full-time staff, including the, including the manager, that are on, uh, on salaries, and the other staff are what we call permanent casuals that generally come from Mount Gambia, which is about 15 k's away. You call them, you know, in other terms, milk harvesters, that sort of thing. So, um, Contractors are used for all the fertilisers, silage, hay, just spudding of calves on calves, um, doing the AI, uh, machinery maintenance, etc. Um, So around with Australian employment law, it is pretty tough over there. Uh, the manager and, and her manager are, are on a salary. Um, but the, those two stipulated under the Act are not allowed to work more than 46 hours per week. So that's coming up to um, 184 hours a month. You know, so that, they're on a salary, so we cannot give them a salary and then you know, you know, pile them up with the hours to reduce the hours, so it comes back on what their hourly rate would be. The rest of the staff that are, that are, that are travelling in, they're on what is called uh, you know, a full-time, or well, casual full-time, I think it's called, and the most they can work is a 38-hour week with a maximum of 152 hours over the, over the year. Don, and Don, the manager, he's employed on salary, and uh, Jennifer, who does all the car fairing and also d does, uh, she's part of that, that group that do maybe between 10 to 30 hours a week, she's employed on an hourly rate. So the total hours for the season, 2016, 2017 season was 6,850. And, and that covered the manager and uh, head manager and all staff, as well as Karen, um, who does all the, um, all the accounts on the farm. Does not include uh, myself. Although, in terms of the physical work on the farm, that I'm, I'm not there a lot. So this equates to 2.9 full-time equivalents on the farm. And you know, when you work it out, it comes to 11 working hours per cow per year. It's a matrix that I'd not e heard of before. It's what, the matrix that I probably use is, is around cents per kilo of milk solids, or uh, number of kilos of milk solids per, per full-time uh, staff member. Right, Lesper Park. The, um, for me, I've never been a fan of the super big, big farms, uh, you know, the thousand plus cows. It takes a special manager to be able to run those sort of farms in terms of multiple herds, um, the staffing side, and, and it's, a, it's a rare skill set. For me, the scale is perfect. Let's see how this works. So distances, that's the cow shed there to there is about 900 metres. From there to the back paddock here is about, um, is about 800. To get the cows out from that back paddock there to the shed, by the time the last cow has come from that paddock there to the shed, the first ones are there, by the time the last cow is into the cow shed, there's generally 60, 60 bar rotary, so 60 cows have been milked and probably another 60 cows are, are on the plant. So we only got 500 odd cows to milk through uh, uh, a 60 bar rotary. The 19 paddocks, in a perfect world, in terms of grazing management, I would have had 20, but it couldn't quite, couldn't quite fit it all in. Um, water tribes at a third, two thirds, so that when we're extending round, um, I should say that in the spring we're generally on a 19 day round, so it's 24, 24 hours in a paddock. You know, it's very, very, very easy to manage. When I took over the farm, uh, the, the race configuration was more that there was, uh, so we still had that lane there. There was a lane that was going through there, feeding off to paddocks through that way. The cows went up this way, so you had quite a you know, right angle bend there and going, going through that way. This pivot wasn't here. There was a, I don't like taking trees out, but there was uh, quite a bit of, uh, you know, a lot of trees through there. And it was a traveller on there, traveller irrigator, that you'd have to shift every day, twice a day in some cases, so uh, I took that out, put a pivot in. These here are the effluent tanks, so we run in like a, a, a two pond situation, but the, but the tanks, um, so effluent is collected from the cow shed, goes into the first tank and then into the second tank, and from that it's diluted through, through the pivots, so every time the pivot goes on, uh, we turn the, uh, 
push a button and the effluent is going through the pivots um, on these three pivots here. So, uh, yeah, good labour saving device. Milking time in the spring when cows are peaking at an excess of 30 litres. Uh, that's around two and a half hours average in the morning and afternoon, and that's cleaned up. The yard in the cow shed is a, a flood washing component, and we also use um, uh, in order of water saving, so we've got a green, a green system line that runs back to the shed to be able to um, cl clean the yard. should also say with the effluent is that uh, when the effluent's going out onto the paddock, it's about a 4% concentration with the irrigation water, putting through uh, uh, over, over 90 hectares. Calf rearing is very simple. Jen is a great calf rearer. One large calf shed placed close to the cow shed with a, um, with a milk line that goes to, the, goes to the shed. Calves, when they come in uh, through the spring, uh, are fed twice a day for the first week, once a day after that in a bat situation. Um, very fortunate, Jean is uh, she's a top calf rearer and has very minimal losses. From three and a half weeks, uh, the calves are out. We've got... Uh, Probably doesn't show up. Oh, yes, it does. So we've got a few. Uh, um, that's the calf shed there. That's the cow shed there. And we've got a lot of calf rearing paddocks there. And then, then once they're sort of into that, uh, not getting milk in that, these areas around here uh, are used for, for calf rearing. Should also point out with the farm system, just um, changing tack a little bit, that with um, these are the dryland areas that I, that I alluded to before. And that area there is used as support land, so cows are wintered on there um, uh, you know, in March, which is uh, the start of the break. We, um, we reseed those. We've got to put annuals in every year because of uh, you know, lack of rainfall to maintain pasture through, uh, through, through the summer. And then we winter the cows on, on that area. So it's a sort of self-contained sort, of, uh, sort of situation. In short, all the staff are concentrating on grazing cows, on grazing grass by the cows. Um, very small amount of machinery. Uh, the bale buggy for feeding out, uh, I should point out, we are making silage off these uh, dry land areas here, but it's about 300 bales a year at the very most, and then that's fed out to uh, cows through the winter. We, we're not feeding out silage to uh, cows through the, um, through the normal milking season um, or hay. We are feeding, uh, we feed, you know, barley through the through the cow shed, um, and feeding up to a ton, uh, a ton of uh, barley a cow a year. So, as I said, the the, the, the staffing side with with having um, with having that concentration of cows, that high stocking rate. Um, the managers have got used to that, that the philosophy in terms of trying to manage deficits. That's a hell of a lot easier than managing uh, surpluses. So um, part of this, I thought I'll put the, um, put the financials through. We have Australia Dairy Base run by uh, Neil Lane from uh, Dairy Australia. So um, we put the figures through Dairy Base to see you know, in terms of the impact of um, financial performance. So when I look at this, I think this is, this is less per park here. So we've got kilos of milk solids, the size of the farm, and, and, and labour expenses up that side. So generally, uh, Neil was telling me that uh, in Victoria and South Australia, the, the average sort of farm labour cost is around that uh, $1.10 for the top 25% of farmers. So that's $1.10 or, uh, per kilo of milk solids. Lesbos in a sweet spot with being 74 cents. So one of the things you can see by this, by this here, by this graph, is that obviously, you know, there's no real economies of scale in terms of the larger, larger size. There's actually also maybe a little bit of diseconomy. There is diseconomies of scale in terms of, uh, you know, if it's too small, um, you know, labour cost per kilo of milk solids up. So I've, yeah, ever, even when I was share milking, I always knew when I had that 200, first share milking job of 220 cows, that yes, I was working damn hard on that. I looked at a share milking job, which was about sort of 270, and I could have got, you know, taken the 270, but when I worked out the, the, the labour cost, I was having to employ an extra full-time unit, and all that expenses was going to go, well, all that income, extra income, was going to go into uh, labour expenses. 
This hasn't come up. Here we go. So again, variable costs, which is like herd, feed, shared costs. Um, on this side, we, you know, we're showing that um, uh, when going through uh, dairy base, it's showing that uh, we're, you know, our, our graze feed is around 80, 85 per cent. Um, um, shows the, uh, definitely shows the focus on uh, on pasture. Overhead cost versus graze pasture shows the focus on uh, you know low vehicle use, so uh, don't need labour to, to drive tractors. So um, scale is right, um, stocking rate is right. We have a big focus on the farm. I'm always asking what the TFD is, which is tractor free days, um, and. Uh, you know, and I've got I've got one manager who actually enjoys enjoys the machinery side, but since that focus, he knows that uh, on, on not really wanting to use the tractor, and that he's got more time with family, um, and he's got you know, he's got young young children. That going back onto the management of the on the farm, the um, we probably do we're, we're having to do one round of topping, and that's all. So we do. Um, um, in terms of domain quality, when we're sort of growing that 100 kilos a day, when you know demand is that 80, so be just before the um, uh, the, the drop off in, uh, in pasture growth. So again, return on return on assets compared with uh, feed growth. So again, uh, oper um, yeah, operating costs. Of, so again, showing the focus on on, on pasture. Return on assets versus graze feed. So again, uh, probably you know since last season the land price has increased, so probably um, you know the, the bigger asset price just as it is at the moment. But you know we're around 14 percent. So again, showing the focus on the, on pasture, and we can get a high return on cash return on capital. Again, that EBIT earnings uh, earnings before interest and tax. Um, versus uh, versus farm farm size. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> where am I going? Sorry about that. Technology, keep me away from it. So again, um, uh, earnings earnings before uh, earnings before interest and tax. So it's showing that. Um, keep going. Yeah, yeah. We. Sorry about that. Earn, earnings, earnings before interest and tax uh, per kilo milk solid. So, so again, showing the, you know, there's no real gain in terms of the super size, but again, an issue around um, around if you if you are too small. And that's my presentation. Thanks very much. Chris, we, 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 I've been sort of sacrificed this morning to try to do something new, but we'll run this conventional for a minute. So any, any questions for Chris? And then I'm going to hold on to you for the next session as well, Chris. You probably don't need a microphone. <laughs> Give this man a drink and a microphone, please. I'll give you my own microphone, Michael. Would you like to accompany me onto the stage? <laughs> ah, come on, Michael, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, you see, yeah. Now, this is my gig, remember. This is my gig. John, I bow to superior power. I would not have been able to do that really fancy thing you did with the computer. So, you're the best. <laughs> Chris, <clears throat> and I, I should be down here. Um, the, the element of the... The, the, the labour, the strict labour laws, does that, that discipline, does that help in actually keeping the hours to per cow to where they're at? And the second part of the question is, I've seen a number of irrigation systems now and it appears to be a very positive correlation with high output from irrigation systems and lower labour. In other words, the wintering element is covered by, the, by you know, good grass growth through the pivots 
and then not needing a winter system per se. Is that a help? Yeah, well, the answer to the first question is that there's no doubt with the, with the strict, strict laws in Australia as of, compared to New Zealand, it's meant that communication skills with staff have to be, um, you know, we, we're talking all the time to the staff in terms of the part-time uh, part casuals that are coming in. We've got uh, one lady that, you know, she likes to work in the morning. She's got a husband that, um, you know, does a night shift, so he, he, he's coming home at about sort of five in the morning, and then she's heading out to uh, come out to the farm to do the, to do the milking. So it, it has, you know, it's certainly sharpened uh, myself and the manager's minds on terms of the, um, the management of labour and in, to, in terms of, um, you know, what, what they want. Um, a lot of the, the labour that is used on the farm is used in that first part of the season. So once we get to, um, um, you know, through that carving side, rearing calves, but once we get through that singular carving and then it's, you know, the workload slims down a little bit for, for the mating season. So we go August, September, October, November, we have a 10 week sort of breeding program. So for like six months, all we're focusing on is milking the cows. You know, um, part of that labour law is that when they um, the part-time casuals come out to the farm, I think they've, we've got to pay them for at least three hours. Um, and that's all. for the second part of the question, I, it was around irrigation, and the, you know, and I can't remember the total part of the question. But one of the things with irrigation is that um, you can really set a system up. You, you know, through the year, just pretty well within five percent. You know, or less than that in terms of how much feed you're going to going to grow. So it's a very, you know, it's a replicable model. Um, I've been using irrigation for you know 28 years, I suppose. Um, in Australia, with that, uh, with I suppose you know, a higher winter rainfall, um, it's not an even distribution. So um, you are, if you're a dryland farmer, you are reliant on uh, on you know on the grain and using those sort of supplements and that, I'd rather pay the, pay the, you know, the cost of irrigation and be sure what I've got. I'm not a price taker um, in terms of um, buying supplements and that sort of thing. I'm not sure if I answered your question on that. Yeah. While I'm waiting for another question, and please put your hand up before so we can get the microphone to you. Chris, just explain a little bit about the wintering. Am I right in thinking all those cows are carried on that block? Yep. And the total amount of feed that comes in is a ton of barley per cow. All your winter feed and everything is produced on the block and fed out on the non-irrigated areas. Just so, talk so, a little bit yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. so the, um, the dry land, um, we, we winter the cows on there. We winter the cows. So, so we, it, once, once a year we've got a seed and we're putting in annuals through there. Um, we do... Uh, probably do one and a half grazings on that dry land with the milking herd, but that's taken into and in, in, uh, in that figure of the 85% um, grazed pasture. So, and then we we dry off in blocks according to uh, according to calving date, cow condition because of what you know the amount they're fit being fed and, and obviously producing is cow condition is never an issue. So we're probably only not milking for about three. Um, three weeks at the at the very most, although you know, having minimal numbers at, at the end. So then those cows are going out onto the onto the dry land. The silage that has been cut off the dry land is being fed to the to, for the for the wintering cows. Yeah. Okay. That's. So obviously, yeah, four farms over there. Um, I I travel uh, across to the farms once a month, where I'll uh, I'll drive across 420 k's. And one of the fortunate things is, with Australia being so big, is that there are various ways to get there. And you know, I, you know, I love looking at land, and uh, so I don't mind the drive. So I go across there, spend four days or five days on farm with the managers um, for, for basically one week, and then another week of that month I'll fly across and I'll either spend one night, two days, or two days, uh, two nights, three days over, over at the farm. Um, 
In terms of formal reporting, it is, it's very informal, so there's no written reports, but the guys know that if, I, you know, if they need something, they'll ring me. If I can't answer the call, I'll be back to them uh, straight away. So I'd be in, in daily, it would, I'd probably be in contact with the managers every second day via, uh, via the phone. And one of the great things with the dairy industry is that you know, I get a text every day from every farm via the dairy company that's telling me exactly how many litres and you know, what's happening. So it shows up in the vat pretty well um, straight, ad, you know, straight away. Just as a follow-up to that while we're waiting for one, when, when you ring a manager or a manager rings you, what, what are your first three key questions you ask him to get you a feel of how things are going out there? Yeah. I know you have your text from the dairy company showing <laughs> What would you get? You get liters. Would you get fat and protein? Yeah, yeah fat and protein, uh, um, somatic cells. Um, you know how much we've produced for that particular month. But you know, so, I can guarantee that the first question I ask them: What's our average cover doing? What are the residuals doing? And what are we going into? Okay. So they're all around grass. The first the yeah, absolutely. questions. Chris, uh, you calve 650 cows in 10 weeks. What do you do with uh, bull calves, and okay. how many uh, how many casuals come in during that time? Sorry, how many? How many casual workers, as you yeah, call yeah. them, come in during that time? Yeah. So um, yeah, we, I suppose yeah, we we we're on on the Lesper Park farm, we're sort of peak milking around that sort of 620. So at that stage, we'll have three. So we'll have probably five people on the farm, but you know, three of them are casuals ca coming in. Um, it's a, it's a, it is a hard one to manage, and you know, the odd time we've had to obviously uh, pay time and a half and all that sort of thing when things haven't uh, quite quite gone right. Um, uh, but at any one time, like with the cow shed, we're only needing two on the cow shed. Like if I was back in my in my peak days of fitness and probably being a bit crazy, you know, I know that I could run that farm with cut removers. There's no cut removers in the shed, I should, should have pointed out. So very low te technology in the shed, no cut removers, no ID, good drafting system, but it's not auto drafting or anything like that. So I know that I could uh, you know, probably run that farm on my own back in the day. Um, so the, yeah, the peak time is um, you know, in that spring time. Um, Ten, ten weeks of, um, well, it's eight weeks, sorry, of, um, of cows calving, but we have very, very good systems and, to, and communi communication skills between all the guys. They all know what they're doing. All the staff have been through various training models and that sort of thing. Yeah. Just before we, how, how soon are the bull calves leaving the farm? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, bull calves are leaving uh, at four days of age. Um, you know, again, we're facing that same issue around you know, the, the bobby calf side, and um, I'm not sure what the answer is, whether it's using sex semen and then bulls. You know, very strong beef industry in Australia, so there is a demand for, for, for bull calves or, or beef calves anyway. So um, we do a little, you know, we rear a lot of extra um, surplus um, heifer calves. Um, that, that particular farm, the Lesper farm, we have DNA'd all the cows, so we, you know, it's really, really hard to get good figures on uh, on, on cows, and so we're DNAing, you know, matching bulls to, uh, to to the cows, and using that as our core herd in terms of building up replacement numbers around uh, existing farms and also future farms. Just um, running such a lean system, how do you manage staff illness? And have you compared um, days lost for, for, let, for illness compared to New Zealand farms or any other farms? Um, again, like um, I, I wouldn't actually know where our, you know, in terms of um, in terms of time off for uh, you know illness sort of sets. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the things is that yeah, we generally have probably. Two, you know, there's two full-time staff members. There's Jen can come in and cover um, if if we have a staff member off because we're only, you know, for eight months a year, we're only really needing two people on that farm, and we have got a call of people that we can go outside our our um, you know our part-time casuals. You know, we have got access to other people that will come in and do maybe two or three milkings or something like that. Hi. Uh, Becky.
Becky Leach from AHDB Dairy. Um, you said that you have um, staff that have gone through various training modules. Can you just expand a little bit on, you know, how you would set up those modules to, leave, to achieve that sort of level of uh, efficiency of, of labour? Yeah. I mean, the, the managers on the farms have got um, very high levels of skills around pasture base. All, all the managers have come through from New Zealand and, and um, uh, I think, yeah, three, three of the four have come from Canterbury, so have come from an irrigation sort of model type system. Generally have a rule that if, you know, any staff member that wants to do training, I will pay for it, no matter what. So, um, and in uh, Mount Gambier, there, there are various workshops run, you know, like we have, you know, what's called TCB 1, 2 and 3, you know, levels of farm management, farm business, you know, deploy diploma in farm business management. So I'll pay for, you know, if staff have been there for like six months, I'll pay, as a general rule, I'll pay for any sort of um, uh, farm training that is needed. Karen, who does all the um, HR and paying accounts for the farms, you know, we've just put through her quite an intensive uh, um, HR course run through Dairy Australia uh, that was done in various mo modules over about a year. So quite a significant cost, but um, uh, you know, well, I think it's well worth it, so, yeah. Chris, I, want, I wonder, jumped up to me, you're doing 560, am I getting it right? 560 kilos of milk, salads of cow, and only a ton of supplement at a very high stocking rate. If I'm sitting down there and I'm doing 400, give me a couple of things that you would advise to move me from 400 to 560. Oh, we shouldn't be production driven. Mike Murphy keeps telling me that. <laughs> I agree, I'm only reading half of what went up. Yeah. I think like with the Australian dairy system, the, the, the cows over there uh, have followed the, the, like the British Holstein or you know, US sort of genetics, so they're a larger, they're a larger cow. Um, there's plenty of farmers around me that are sort of you know, chasing the, you know, the 10 and a half thousand litre cow. You know, we haven't gone down that route. But it has meant that when I'm trying to buy cows, I've generally gone, you know, I've had to buy a larger cow. Um, so we, we've got a, uh, one particular herd that's on the Watton Park, Park farm. That's even a larger size cow. I've ended up buying a herd that probably averaged 600 kilos of cow. We've just done, you know, done our first mating on that farm. We've brought it back to using all the you know, Kiwi Cross. So we're trying to bring the scale back. But one of the things with, um, you know, my template is it's, it's one herd, you know. I don't need an extra person going out, bringing a second herd in so we can run it with two, with two people. Um, um, so it's with the 145 hectares of irrigation, like if I was to have a 400 kilo, or, you know, four, 450 kilo life weight cow, it means you know, it'd be 800 cows, so I'd have to be um, having to run two herds. So in a way, the, the, the amount of irrigation is, is really deciding the size of the cows that I need on the farm. So you're relating the cow to the amount of feed you have. Your exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, relating to the whole system. Yeah, yeah just a quick question on um, being an employer that people want to come work for. So in your local area, obviously, there, there would be other, other employers. What, what makes, could you just quickly outline what makes you an employer that people want to come to work for? And the second part of that question in, in relation to what motivates your staff, like um, how much autonomy are you giving your farm managers? Sorry, how much? Autonomy yeah, yeah. in relation to key performance indicators, what targets they have to achieve, and then what's motivating them? Are you giving them a cut of the profit, um, or what, what motivates them to, to work to their best of their ability for you or for themselves? Yeah. Um, I suppose you know, the area that I, uh, I, you know, I farm in, there's only about 120 farms. Um, the Australian dairy industry has, has gone through a bit of a, you know, a downturn. You know, we've had issues with one, one of the major suppliers here, uh, uh, pro producers here, Murray Goldburn. Um, I suppose people know that I'm, I'm trying to expand. I only expand if I've already got the manager. I, you know, at the moment, um, I've, I've got three, three good managers that, that I'm not currently employing that have already approached me looking for opportunities. Because I've seen that I'm trying to, with uh, currently two of the managers coming into the business, in terms of, you know, with the, you know, setting up 50-50 share milking companies um, and that sort of thing. So 
um, they know that I'm, you know, that I'm, I'm wanting to help young people uh, come into the, into the industry. So I'm trying to become a, you know, an employer of choice. I, you know, I wouldn't say I've got it right all the time. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Oh, autonomy, yeah, yep. absolutely. So, so the 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 managers, um, you know, that you know, they treat the farmers as their own. They know that I'm not breathing down their neck. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm 420 k's away, um, but uh, you know, I, you know, I'm, I've got um, you know financial software packages, so I'm always looking where where the accounts sit and all that sort of thing. So the managers, they. Um, um, you know, we have a farm system set up. We know when fertiliser is going to be applied, so they're they're doing all that side in terms of um, we we've got a program where we you know we we know that we're going to be putting on you know 70 units of P, 70 units of K a year, 100 units of sulphur and that sort of thing. So so like like fertiliser, um, we generally talk about the timing on that sort of thing. Um, any major purchases, um, you know, that's always discussed. Um, but that, you know, um, they know how I operate. They, they've got a lot of autonomy on the farm. Like I've been away for what six days. I think I've only had I've had one phone call that's been related to a farm. You know, you know, a few texts from the managers and they just asking how how the jet lag's going and all that sort of thing. So um, no, no, they treat it as their own. And then you know they they they're all they're all part of the business. And one of the one of the things I've really found out with bringing. Uh, one of the managers in as uh, um, you know in, into the share milking model is that how that is and, and so they're getting a return out of how the farm is performing it and how that has even sharpened their focus on what is being spent on 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 the farm so a lot of the questions that come from the managers to me around around decision making is around the the financial side so yeah Okay, I think we'll, 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 we'll hold the questions on Chris because you're staying with us. You don't have known this, Chris, but you're a key part of my panel, so don't move. <laughs> Be beside every great woman. If you can take your seats, please. So a very good morning to everyone and um, thank you to John and his team for a very exciting first session so I'm sure you're all well warmed up and ready to go again. My name is Roberta MacDonald, I work with Arrivo uh, Co-op in the northwest of the country. Okay, so I'll be chairing this very exciting session here this morning basically about you managing yourself before you talk about managing other people. And I know yesterday there was a brief reference to a man called Jim Collins and he had this, this saying, as I'm sure many of you are aware, about getting people on the bus and getting the wrong people off the bus. Well, today we're going to talk about the driver of the bus. We're going to talk about yourselves and maybe what your role can be. Today I'm going to ask you to imagine you're on that bus, that you're the bus driver, the bus is your own business, and you have to decide where you're going, how you're going to get there, and who is coming with you. So to help us on this, we are joined by two excellent speakers this morning. Firstly, we're going to hear from Nolig. Nolig is an independent management consultant based here in Ireland. She works across sectors with businesses from sole traders to multinationals to improve performance by increasing the efficiency of their most valuable asset, their people. Um, and we're also joined by Holly, and Holly is joining us from the UK today, so she's after taking a nice, a nice spin over. Holly is fourth generation of a farming family in the West Midlands, and Holly undertook her Nuffield Farming Scholarship looking at practical applications that can be introduced for business growth through the, the development of people. And since that, she's established this business, Focused Farmers, in the last year. So she's going to talk to us a bit more about that and how to measure the effects on farmers and ag sector workers completing a program of mindfulness and meditation coupled with goal setting. So I suppose with this in mind, the session is going to start with focusing on yourselves, having the skills to drive the people that are in that bus. And Nolig is going to speak to us about being the employer of choice. So Nolig, when you're ready. Thank you. Okay. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here, and my sincere thanks to Mike Murphy and the Positive Farmers team for asking me to be here. Um, it's a good opportunity, while I have the platform, to thank a number of people who have been very helpful in my career um, in, in relation to the dairy sector, and that's Margaret and, and Kevin Toomey, Marion Beecher of Moore Park, and Abigail Ryan, who have been particularly helpful. And I cannot forget my, uh, who I consider my PR or relations manager in the UK, which is Matt Venables, for opening many doors to me. So thank you very much. Um, I'm a little bit excited. I probably sound a bit nervous, but I'm actually really excited because everybody went and they went to their conference last night and I went home and I thought I'd have a nice quiet night and you know, I'd chill out and relax a little bit and I went through my presentation and I thought, yeah, this is how it's going to go. And as I started thinking about it, other things started jumping in and I reflected on John Maloney yesterday who was absolutely outstanding for me, just perfection really. And, but the problem with that was he stole loads of my punchlines. I thought, God, oh, I hate that. I hate when people steal your punchlines or when they're great speakers. And I just was thinking about many of the things he was talking about. So he stole my punchline. So I thought, right, I have to up my game. I'm a chartered sports and exercise psychologist. And when we think about gaining competitive advantage, you know, if you really acknowledge that the opposition is better than you, then you, know, you look for the gap. And what's the gap if we think about the All Blacks? And I think the gap is to go reckless. So today I'm going to go a little bit reckless. And I'm going to go with a bit of pulpit bashing and a bit of pontificating. And I was thinking I should ask Roberta to bring in the stable boy because I would be getting on that high horse. And the reason I'm getting on that high horse and why I got a bit wound up last night and maybe didn't sleep till the early hour of the morning is because I'm standing at the Positive Farmers Conference and I've been asked to speak at the Positive Farmers Conference. And I'm standing in front of Positive Farmers. And yesterday I heard, yes, we're good at grass, we've done it. Yes, we're good at cows, we've done it. Oh, people, dejected, negative. What are we going to do? And one of the critical things that I thought was an outstanding point from John Maloney yesterday was he talked about earning the right to grow. You have to earn the right to have good employees. The sector has to earn the right to be a good employer. And you do that by tackling the issues as you go along the way. So I totally agree with Roberta. Let's talk about the bus. But not just use an employer as the bus, the dairy sector as a bus. So when, you think, when I put it all together, and of course, then we had John McNamara speaking earlier, and I had John McNamara, my husband is in the audience somewhere. You don't know where he is. He's a bit of one of those secret shoppers. So between, I don't know, maybe I was thinking then in psychology, when you are frustrated about something, you project that anger. And maybe it's my frustration with my husband. I'm going to project it on you. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. But the point, is, when I put all of those things together, and John McNamara was talking about, you know, his, his uh, martini, and that's a cocktail. I was thinking, well, all of these things together have somehow created a Molotov cocktail for me today because I am feeling really explosive. So I'm going to let you have the force of it. Um, becoming an employer of choice. Look, I work across all sectors. That is an absolute privilege that I have. When you are working in your sector and you are head down and you're getting on with your job, you believe you are the only people with those problems. And I say to you, that is vanity. That is vanity for the dairy sector to believe that you are the only sector struggling for employers. You know, that's a very self-centered notion that you are the only ones having problems. All sectors are struggling for good employees. Good employees are a rare commodity. You need to make yourself an outstanding employer to be worthy of having good employees. So you need to reflect on yourself and thinking about what it is about you that you can do. And I'm delighted that Holly is speaking after me because she's going to bring along a skill set that is going to totally feed into what I'm speaking about. So becoming an employer of choice and becoming a dairy sector of choice. Let's stop complaining and waiting for good employees to come in the gate. Let's make sure that we are the reason that good employees come in the gate. And that's really what I want to look at today. So I'm going to do this. I was just going to do it as here's a set of tools that you can use. Here's a set of ways that you can take away and work with. But I'm going to think about it and I'm going to challenge you. And, and uh, Shane Maxwell is somewhere in the audience and he asked some absolutely personal questions yesterday. But for, I don't know how many of you know Shane, but when Shane has something bothering him, he'll ring you up and tell you how to do your job. And he rang me recently and he said, you need, to tell pe you need people to go home from your courses with a firm action plan. They need to know what they're doing. I'm not telling you how to do your job, but as he proceeds to tell me how to do my job. And he's absolutely right. So my challenge today is, this is today. Let's start it now. Let's break the broken record. It's in smithereens. We know it's tough to get difficult employees. We know that it is difficult to get the right person in the gate. We know that. So let's stop talking about it and let's do something about it. And hopefully, at the end of our session today, we'll walk away with something positive and engaging. So, what does that employer look like? What does a positive in any sector, what does, any se what does a good employer sector, uh, employment sector look like? Or what does 
That's right. What does a good employment sector look like? What does a good employer look like? Well, they're successful. They've got thriving businesses. They are doing really well. They have an excellent workforce. They have the type of workforce that other people drool about when they think, God, he's got great staff. Oh, if only, oh, God, I'd do anything to poach his staff. So they have wonderful workforces. They have really high retention. But equally, what's interesting about it is they're not afraid of having turnover. There's a real fear in the Irish dairy sector and the UK dairy sector of turnover. And if you fear turnover, well, then you are not going to. And, and I'm going to quote Chris Proctor, who had some really great sayings today. And he talked about having a ruthless culling policy, a harsh culling system. You know, if you aren't thinking about what it is that you want in your business, you have to think, if, you can't just tolerate um, mediocrity. You have to really be very, very strict about what it is you're doing. So you have to be comfortable with high turnover, but striving for retention. And we have this big thing about, oh, well, that's Gen X, and that's Gen Y and the millennials, and that's deflecting away responsibility. That suggests that it's their fault that they won't stay with you, not yours. That is the reality of where we are. You know, we listened to, to Chris Proctor this morning, and he talked about the geographical challenges of his farm in Australia. And he said, but I like it. I drive there, and I like looking at land. I enjoy the helicopter ride. If you have something that is a fact and is there, you work with it. Don't allow it to hold you back. That's absolutely pointless. So we think about how do we move that forward. We've conscientious, engaged, and happy staff. People want to stay there. They're enjoying staying there. They're conscientious. They are the guys who don't rush out the gate at 5 o'clock, though they are perfectly entitled to if they are their contracted hours. And that's a critical one we will come up to. Safe workplaces. You know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look at that actually in the next slide. But safe workplaces, what signals are we sending? The sector has to think about broken glass theory. We have to challenge absolutely everything. You have to get the small things right. And health and safety is not a small thing. It's a colossal thing. It shouldn't be avoided. It should be used as a framework to make you a better employer. So at the moment in Ireland, we have a very narrow window where Irish farming, as a farmer, you are and as an employer, you are going to be differentiated for having a health and safety policy. That's actually appalling. That's a disgrace. And it's the same thing, but it's, it's moved on quite significantly in the UK. I did say to people my main challenge today would be to get across coherently because I'm so enthusiastic about this. But in the UK, they're that bit further ahead where now health and safety is actually a differentiator. And if we look at Marion Beecher and Paddy Kelly and Brendan Horan's research on, on what students think of their host farmers, health and safety comes up as a critical thing. If you don't have a health and safety policy or you take that seriously, you are communicating every day of the week that you are happy to put somebody else's life at risk. And that is an unacceptable um, place to start from. The other thing that's interesting about really good employers is that they are visible and relaxed. We see them. We see them out there. They're the kind of person who think, God, you, you think to yourself, God, they've got a lot of free time. Sure, they're at every event going. The ultimate in leadership is to become obsolete. Create a business that allows you to be away. Create a business that gives you the opportunity to enjoy what your business can provide for you, which is a quality of life and an, a revenue stream that will allow you to do other things. And employers of choice are receptive. They listen. You know, we, Mike Murphy, I don't know how many courses have been on with Mike Murphy, but he is outstanding in his, he's writing now. He's writing nonstop. He is always learning. We think to ourselves, there's Mike Murphy, he's, he, what more could you teach him? And yet he is writing and learning and receptive. So it's thinking about as much as you know, you will always know more. I'm 20 years immersed in psychology of people. I'm 17 years of that as truly immersed in management and leadership, and I'm still gobsmacked every day by what people say to me. So it's really about having that notion that you're always receptive to new information, that there's always opportunity to improve. And don't give the responsibility for good employees to come to you. Take the responsibility of being an exceptional employer and get people in the gate. So where do we start? I was at a conference in um, November in the UK, and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, look, you know, look, I know what you're saying, and it all makes good sense, and it's good, simple stuff, but I just can't remember. Why am I not remembering it? So I thought, right, I'll, I'll do something to help you remember. I'm speaking at the Positive Farmers. Let's work this together. So the first thing I want to talk about, I'm going to give you 10 pointers. Now, from a psychological perspective, research shows that the human brain will remember seven things plus or minus two. So we're looking at five to nine things. But I believe that this is a highly capable and intelligent audience. I believe that farmers are highly capable and intelligent people, something that they are very slow to credit themselves with. And I'm going to hammer you with 10 ideas. So the first thing we want to think about are the groundworks. OK, 
uh, groundworks. And I've, I've put up here the Work Relations Commission, and I was sitting beside Joe Dells from the UK today, and I said, look, who is your equivalent in the UK? And we came up with, you know, you'd go to .gov.uk to think about how do we do this. But Chris Proctor, and I mentioned it in the previous slide, Chris Proctor talked about health and safety um, and employment laws much more stringent in, in Australia. And that's a good thing. Because when we're talking about a complex system like dealing with people, you need frameworks to make that happen. And the health and safety framework is an absolute tool that everybody should be taking on board and working with. Not fighting against, not raging against, but actually using and engaging with. And that's really, really important because when we start, create, when we start looking at the, the um, groundworks and getting it right, we're going to do that critically. Promoting the improvement of workplace relations, relations and maintenance of good re workplace relations. Media has us conditioned to believe that employment law sides with the employee. It does not. It sides with the state. It, it sides with the coffers. It sides with the revenue. It sides with keeping healthy, successful, productive workplace, uh, work relationships in place so that money will continuously be put into the revenue. If you are wasting time in legal action against your employees or employees against employers, you are not being productive in the workplace. And that hurts the state, or that hurts the revenue. So employment law exists to create and maintain good working relationships. Don't fight it, embrace it, and use it to guide you forwards. Business awareness is critical. What is it that you need? You know, maybe I, I might accuse it, maybe it's a cultural thing in Ireland where we, where we use vague statements, how many cows do you have? Ah, about 200. You either have 200 or you don't. It's not about 200. And it's the same thing when we talk about work, a bit of work. I need somebody for a bit of help during the spring. It's not about that anymore. We need to articulate, we need to clarify. We need to put definites in place. Because all day yesterday, I heard you talking about de residuals. I have no idea what you're talking about. Residuals, measurement, all of these things that make you good technical farmers. You're very, very down, switch on, you know, KG solids, whatever you're talking about. You're very, very switched on about it. You need to apply that rigor to people. You need to use that mindset and apply it to people. And that's about compliance, and that's about pr appropriate selection and health and safety. So that's the groundworks. Get those right. They are the set play of employment. Anything I talk about today is irrelevant if you do not have this in place, because every day that you do not have contracts in place, you do not have health and safety in place, you don't understand your business, you send a signal to the employee pool, to the rest of the world, that you are not worth working for, because not only do you not respect employees, you do not respect yourself or your business. And I personally would not want to work for you. Okay. Next thing we're looking at is remove ambiguity. And this is about clarity and creating focus. And yesterday we had John Maloney speaking about um, project management, you know, planning. And planning is critical. And, and creating clarity so that people know where they stand. This notion of, you know, people go, oh, I don't like doing timesheets. And I don't want to set structure. People want to know where they are at any one time. It creates clarity for them. I specialize in change management. The biggest barrier to change management is fear of the unknown. So when you want to, you need to create clarity. You will look across sectors and you will say, why would that person work when I can give them a much better job on my farm? It may well be because their employer tells them when they'll start and when they'll finish and what to expect, and they fulfill on those promises. Okay? So it's really, really important we create that clarity. We plan. Don't find yourself in the middle of spring looking for, for an employee. That's madness. You knew for 12 months prior that your spring calving block was going to be pressured. Do plan it in advance. Think about it in advance. Task prioritization is critical. What needs to be done, having that focus, timely communication. I, you know, Chris Proctor, again, he spoke about the critical thing with the Australian employment law is it forces you to communicate. There is no substitution for communication when we talk about human interaction. It's really easy to dismiss it and say, oh, they don't understand me. If they don't understand you, that is your fault, not theirs. You have to create an opportunity where people understand you and know what you're doing. And communication should be timely, and it will not be timely when you're stressed and pressured and you're already behind yourself. So you need to have it in a timely position where people are receptive to it. That's why we would see the conferences, for example, happening in January, where in theory you're relaxed with a bit of free time to go to these things, learn them, and then move on to the spring calving. And standard operating procedures are an absolute tool that everybody should be using. The common assumption which happens across businesses is it's an abuse of that idea that standard operating procedures removes autonomy from the, from the system. Standard operating procedures do not remove autonomy from the system. That is not what they are about. They are an external memory system that means when I'm off farm, somebody knows what to do. 
they can access information about what to do. Standard operating procedures are also a critical tool when you want to remove waste from the system, getting rid of redundant habits. So don't be afraid to remove ambiguity by creating clarity and understanding what you're doing. Um, a, a chap said to me earlier, you know, he sat down in timesheets and when he looked at it, he actually went, oh my God, I actually work quite a lot. We don't know these things until we start measuring and recording and planning. Um, so the next one is accountability. And this is really, really critical. And I would hold, I stand here today and I hold the Farmers Journal and all the media and I hold you all accountable. And I hold every farmer in the room accountable for being your own worst enemy. You do not market yourselves as good employers. If I say to you, farming is a wonderful lifestyle, you get to be in the great, in the great outdoors, I'll have a smart comment saying, yeah, it doesn't feel like that in February. You know, that's not the point. You've got to be accountable for how you behave. You've got to be accountable for the perception that you put out there. And it's not about the media sprawling everywhere in their papers. Crisis, in man at labor, we can't, there's a big labor issue, we can't get the labor issue. If I am somebody who never worked in dairy before, and my exposure to dairy is it has an employment problem and a labor problem, well, I'm gonna run the other way. Because I'm gonna go, well, they already have a problem and I'm, I ain't going there because I have my own problems. So we need to think about what it is that we need to challenge and define and be the people who drive that bus, but also create what that bus looks like. So the accountability concept is about this idea of you should be challenging yourself, accountability, so understanding when an employee can't do something, an employee won't do something. If an employee can't do something, that is your fault. You gave them insufficient time, you gave them insufficient resources, insufficient opportunity, or you set them up to fail. When an employee, an employee won't do something, you have to be, and that's, you've, you've done a self, you've done a feedback loop, and you know that, that you have given every opportunity for that employee to do well, well then you hold them accountable. You don't have the conversation in your head that I hear every day of the week. I let the little things go because it's better, to, what if they walk? It's better to have somebody than to have nobody. The minute you allow that mentality to creep into your business, you are accepting lower standards for yourself. You're putting pressure on yourself and you're putting pressure on the business. So it is absolutely critical that you think about holding people accountable and challenging them for the small things. And when we challenge for the small things, we don't get to the big thing because we are accountable. At what point can you actually hammer that person if you didn't challenge them up to it? And that's part of employment law as well. You have to give the warning, you have to give the verbal warning, you have to give the written warning. We have that already, we have that process in place. And acknowledgement, acknowledgement that mea culpa, I was wrong, I did badly as, to, towards you as an, employer, as an employee, and equally, you made the difference, you changed, thank you, well done, fantastic. Acknowledgement. So acknowledging when you were wrong and acknowledging when somebody else has been wrong and corrected themselves. Really robust systems, they will come to you and say, I've made a mistake. If you have a toxic scenario, you will have employees hiding things from you. And that is significant or, or um, is, is, is symptomatic of the system because they feel that they can't approach you. That is toxic management and toxic leadership. Self-awareness, I kind of patted myself on the back yesterday for, for a level of self-awareness because I was so absolutely impressed with John Maloney yesterday. I thought if I, if I go up and speak to him, I run the risk of, of getting down and, and kissing his feet and there's no dignified way of getting out of that when you're a professional. You know, you can't cling onto somebody's leg and, and say, please, listen, you're amazing. So that's a level of self-awareness where I had to remove myself from the room just not to, to, to disgrace myself. But when we think about self-awareness, it takes courage to challenge yourself. The industry needs to have the courage to challenge itself and saying, why, what are we doing that is preventing other people from being employed? Not sitting back and ex, you know, having this some kind of sense of entitlement that you should have good employees. You have to be, it has to be really critical about itself and say, what are we doing wrong? I was working um, before Christmas and I went over to, to Matt Venables um, in um, Anglesey and uh, his business partner, John Joe Roberts, was saying about, you know, it's the simple things that make a difference. Taking your boots off before you go into the village shop. They're the things that send signals. And it's like holding ourselves, it's the industry having an awareness about how are we allowing ourselves to be perceived? Are we happy to be covered in slurry going into town? You know, is that the signal we want people to see? What about the signal we want to see? Self-awareness, what do you do well and marketing that? So it's all about marketing. Reflection, so reflecting what have we done well? We know that the positive farmers, we know we listened to it yesterday, Con, um, the tribute to Con Hurley. Reflection, what have you done well? You've made the move towards the grass-based system. You've won that fight. 
you know, genetics and all of those improvements and this phenomenal research in Moore Park is moving forward on the idea of, um, sorry, I got the five minute warning and I'm thinking, God, I'm a long way from five minutes finished. But um, it, it's really understanding yourself and challenging saying, reflection, what has the industry done well and what can we do well again? What good employees did I have? Where are my great employees? Why did it work? You know, that's really valuable information. Thinking about others, exposing yourself to others, challenging yourself, creating mentor systems, and then measurement. Measure yourself. How, do, how am I doing in comparison to last year? Speaking to your employees, are we communicating better? Am I giving you a better system? Am I better at letting you go on time than I was? Measure yourself, challenge, and sharpen the saw. Okay? And that's the self-awareness. And the next one is the sharpen the saw, which is continuous learning. You know, don't just, it's not stagnant. We are continuously learning. Be stagnant. You know, I suppose farming is, is um, it's, a, it's a reasonably simple system and we might run the risk of, of tweaking it and, 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 you know, causing trouble for it. And I had the discussion with Holly this morning. Um, but the brilliant thing about people management is there is continuous learning. And that can be the really exciting space in dairy. It can give you the opportunity to work with wonderful people. And Shan Bushell, you know, she commented on the wonderful guys that sat up here yesterday and talked to the industry in a really positive and engaging way. And that's absolutely critical. So that's the challenge in service, is continuous learning. Emulation, you know, who can we be like? How can we be better at this? Who is a good sector to be with at the moment? We might look in Ireland, we might say, um, I don't know, who's software? Software, computer, technology. Let's face it. Computer technicians are geeky nerds who sit in a room somewhere, but they've got a brilliant marketing team that exposes their phenomenal expertise through the products that they sell. You've got outstanding ability in the Irish industry when we think of Ornua and Origin uh, Green, and we think of people like Kerry and how they market themselves around the world. That knowledge should be applied to the farmers and brought back. And it's about that network that you use. Respect is absolutely critical. Um, speaking of time, I'm under pressure, but time is about res respecting, some, respecting somebody else's time is the biggest deal breaker as I see it as a consultant in the industry, not allowing people home when you should. Mis disrespecting somebody else's time communicates every day that your time is more valuable than them. And the easiest way for me to describe that, I, I was fortunate to be in a group recently in Mull Nevat and it was a supervisory skills course, and a guy said, you know, if somebody's 10 minutes late for me in the morning, I would be livid, I'd be frustrated, and I'd be angry, and they're stealing from me, and they're putting pressure on the system. But at the other end of the day, I'm quite happy to say, sure, it's only 10 minutes. What's the difference? And that is double standards. That is, I value my time, I do not value your time. Challenge yourselves. And unfortunately, unfortunately I see heads nodding here, which means you're capable of doing that too. Individual differences, people think differently to you. They have different learning capacity. They have different feelings and, and emotions and learning styles and working styles. Embrace that as a difference, not as a, as a bad thing. You know, this, creating these differences as, oh, that's how millennial thinks, or that's how the new generation thinks, oh, the youth of today. Looking for those differences, you will find them. Embracing those differences, you will create leverage for yourself. Observe. It's a bit like my, my husband's is like the secret shopper today and I, I sent him out there as a spy seeing what she thought about me. No, that's a joke. But observation, when we think of observation, it is critical. It is stepping back and reflecting. And God, dairy farmers do that every day of the week and they are brilliant at it. A cow passes you, an animal passes you, a calf passes you and you think, what are they looking like? What's their condition like? What's their body score condition like? Are their eyes bright? Are they dull? Are they, you know, have they moist noses? What is going on? And we do this every single day of the week. Apply that same valuable skill to people. Challenge your own assumptions. What you see isn't always what's there. You think that somebody is being belligerent and difficult because they're 10 minutes late. They just can't get to you sooner because they're on the school run. But you don't know that unless you challenge your assumptions. Catch them doing it right. Don't be that person who sneaks out, and, you know, standing around and observing and then appears when something is going, right or going wrong. Catch people doing it right and let them know they're doing it right. And then others, see who their others are, who they're hanging around with, who are their friends and what's the influence and how do other people respect them. Upskill. Upskill is about investing in the asset. And Chris Proctor said he, you know, he would, anything that is farm related and training, he would be happy to pay for it. I'll happily pay for that, that's an investment. And that comes to the point at the bottom, which is the trust point. If you invest in somebody, you have to trust that they are going to return that for you. If you do not invest in somebody because you think they're going to walk out the gate, you don't deserve that person in the first place. So it's really about trusting somebody. It's having patience that they learn at a different skill as to, patient to you. You are an expert in your own business, of course you learn faster. And then it's supporting them and learning that. 
So when somebody goes away, you need to support their opportunity to go away and learn something that they can bring back on farm. Teamwork is about you know, engaging with the team and individualized consideration is absolutely critical. The team is made up of individuals. We need to stop talking about farmers, farmers. We need to think about what is right for your individual system. There are plenty of standards that we are aspiring to, but it must meet and fit your system. And that is about individualized consideration for you. You know, certain types of employees won't work for you. For some certain types of employee contracts won't work for you. You need to know your business, which refers to the first slide. Recognition and pride, believing your staff, motivating your staff, not arriving and complaining at discussion groups about your staff. Okay, active engagement, engaging with your staff is a positive asset. And emo emotional intelligence is my last one on, on, on my point, and it's emotional intelligence is this idea of self-regulation, understanding yourself, moving towards people, understanding people for their differences and appreciating that, putting yourself in somebody's feet. That is about creating relationships. It's understanding the leverage that you get when you create good assets. In, the West, in Western society, our limiting factor are our people. If we consider that dairy is a triadic relationship between grass, cow, and people, why do we leave people to be retrofitted? An outstanding comment from Chris Proctor this morning, I do not expand until I have my, the right manager. How many people in this room do that? How many people find the manager and then get the cows and grass in place? Very few. We leave people to last, and yet it is people who get the grass and the cows to the place you need them to be. So we need to stop challenging and raging against the machine. We need to start thinking about how can we, as an industry, be an outstanding employer that people flock to us and say, I want to work in dairy. I want to be part of what you have. And referring to my previous point about how will you remember all of this, well, I can't explain to you the level of smugness I felt when I came up with this idea. Because to be an employer of choice, and this is absolute homage to, to the positive farmers and you know, Mike Murphy and Con. Think grassroots. Okay? Think grassroots. We're talking about grass here today. If you struggle to remember what to do with people, regard, you know, even though you are absolutely top marks with grass and with people, think grassroots. This is your mnemonic. Bring it home with you. And if you can tick off some or any of these points today, now, and I come back to Shane's challenge, engage and work with the concept that people management is grassroots. It is low cost if we get it right. It is high impact if we get it right. It is life changing. So thinking about grassroots and my two key factors, and I know, um, I suppose you could say, God, you gave us 10, why did you pick out two of your favorites? But my two are the respect. My two are the respect and the upskill. Invest in people as an asset and they will return that investment to you. So it's really, really thinking about how can you move your business forward? And I say, how can we move the, the um, industry forward? Let's do that, let's embrace it today. Let's go on and stop whinging, stop complaining that you don't have good employees. Be good employers. And before I finish, every single person here, turn to the person and shake hands with them. Turn to the person beside you and shake hands. And why do I say that? Because, why do I say that? Because every day of the week I hear about the dairy industry does not have good employees. You are all employees of the dairy, dairy sector. And by extension, you are insulting yourselves by assuming the dairy sector does not have good employees. So don't just be good employees to the dairy sector. Challenge the dairy sector to be a phenomenal employer as you all stand here and will put your hand up and say, and bring that back to your own business and be phenomenal employers and create a phenomenal sector that everybody, including myself, enjoys working for. Thank you.